Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Peter Wasserman and uh, Benjamin LaRue here to do today's presentation. So with that, uh, Benjamin, we're gonna turn over the mic. We're gonna let you have center stage. Uh, one of the things we'd like to hear you tell us um, throughout the presentation is a little bit about the 16, 17 vintage and then what we can expect on the vintages coming in. So with that, everyone, welcome Benjamin LaRue. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Thank you, thank you. It's good to, to, to see all of you. I hope you're doing well, you know, where you are. Uh, just, just, just briefly, do, I, don't, do, do, I don't need to introduce myself huh, anymore. I don't think so. No. <laughs> so uh, maybe, maybe we could start just like to, to get the, because, you know, in the last two months, which was uh, a bit strange for all over the world, uh, of course, you know we had uh, we had we had we, don't, we didn't have any visits, so we you know we focused a lot in in the vineyards because that was the only place we could go. And uh, it's a super early year, you know it's flowering at the moment, uh, 15 of 15 of May, so which means we're expecting a harvest at the end of August. So maybe uh, you know it could be as early as the uh, third week of August or. Fourth week, fifth of August. Why I'm talking about 2020 is because, you know, five years ago it was surprising to, well, it was like, um, you know, almost strange to harvest in August. Now it seems, uh, it seems to be, uh, you know, the the normality. And uh, that's exactly what's happening in Burgundy since since 2000 2015. And at one exception, probably is 2016. That's why I was I was I was going. Uh, I'm going. I'm going this way. 2016, uh, we suffered from frost, so it's a much uh, much smaller year in terms of a uh, crop. And uh, with the frost, the vines, you know, stopped. Is uh, it's growing for about two to three weeks, and uh, we had uh, a slightly later uh, ripe ripening. So. Um, Vintage with uh, with definitely uh, slightly less alcohol in terms of balance and uh, slightly more acidity, which which is probably the last you know uh, vintage with um, with the wines you know I grew up in Burgundy. Now the style is definitely uh, changing. We have a switch. Uh, let's say it on one way. It was a bit. Uh, you know, uh, not scary, but uh, you know, we were worried about where, where, where uh, you know, the new type of ripeness were were bringing us. But uh, looking back now, with, uh, with 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 a couple of vintages, I quite like it. You know, we're making different wine, but uh, we're making wine with uh, still good balance, good acidity. Uh, we don't have to chaptalize anymore, so the natural alcohol is uh, is good enough. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the alcohol is, uh, is not high enough to avoid the tax, uh, the 25% tax. I know that uh, at, uh, at Becky Wasserman at, uh, at the office, they asked me how many wine were over 14, and uh, above 14, I think we have only two wine in 18. So it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not many. But that said, you know, usually the balance are pretty great. So 16, let's say, uh, a vintage like like uh, like Burgundy before, with a very very light uh, light style uh, fruit with lots of flesh, uh, pretty elegant, quite quite nice in both color. Uh, I love the reds. I love the reds. They remind me a lot of the 2010. Uh, for those who knows, the only down downside of 2016 is the quantities. Uh, the quantity were really really low. Uh, it was like a 50% down in general, but sometimes in some appellation, it's 80% down. So uh, when you can, if you still got a bit of 16, you know, like uh, it's, it's great, but uh, the, there's not, there are not many, many, many left on the, on the market anyway. Uh, with 17, 17, so harvest in August, uh, but with a pretty cool summer, you know, not 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 of a warm uh, temperature. So pretty, um, again, pretty good balance. We're not on the dark fruit. We're not on the black fruit. 
you know, of a, of a, well, with, with high ripeness. It's, it's something also quite, quite interesting because every year we're beating the, like, you know, like uh, the record in terms of weather forecast of average temperature of a uh, very low um, um, rainfall. But that said, you know, that we don't have any, uh, any vintages which are imposing its style to the wine. Uh, sometimes, you know, like you, you, I, I saw a couple of critics, you know, um, um, looking at 2018, like 2003 was, but they, they, are, they are very different, very different. 2003, the style of the vintage was definitely super, super uh, uh, over, overpowering, you know, the, 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 the style of the, of the appellation when it's absolutely not the case in 17, in 18, and uh, in the near future for, for 19. And I think with, with all those warm vintage also, we're starting to have a bit of experience, which is also um, interesting. Uh, so 17, 17 uh, if, if, I mean, so again, both color are great. The reds are lovely. You could, you could approach, you know, like, a, uh, you could drink some of the 17 now. Uh, they're, they're, they're very, uh, you know, no, no offense if you're opening a 17 now, because like on the village wine or even some premier cru, such as, you know, uh, the Volmi premier cru, they are they're pretty open and they've always been open and, uh, and tasting well from barrel, after bottling, no shock, always, always doing great. But the surprising one in 2017 was the white. Because uh, uh, when I was saying, you know, I was worried or even like scared of having higher temperature and warmer, uh, warmer weather and uh, higher ripeness. Uh, I always trust the Pinot Noir will cope easily with that, but I was not very confident with Chardonnay and the whites. But actually, uh, the 17 whites are brilliant. They're brilliant. They have some freshness. Although, of course, it's not based on the on, uh, on the malic and lactic acid balance, but more on the tartaric. And uh, they are therefore, they are more citrusy, zesty, and uh, they have a vibrancy, which of course is not like 14, but not far from that, not far from that. And uh, for me, the whites are, it's a, it's, it's a top vintage in white in 17. Uh, and again, in 18, Although I know that uh, sometimes the reputation is that some, some of the wines are heavy, but believe me, you know, the whites are whew, they're pretty, uh, pretty great. Most of them are getting back to reductive, uh, slightly reductive style. You know, we achieved the bottling a month ago, so uh, uh, they're pretty fresh from bottling and uh, works, works pretty well, pretty well. But some, uh, some are also pretty approachable now, you know, such as Ossé du Reste, Saint-Romain, a little wine. So, uh, yeah, you know, for, so far, so good. We're pretty happy with, uh, you know, with the last few vintages. And then you have a 19, which will be coming, uh, coming soon, uh, with, you know, will, which is going to be uh, quite an outstanding vintage also in both columns. So uh, we, we're living, we're living quite, a, quite a nice, you know, uh, area of time we will i'm sure we will do another bad vintage in, in the, and i hope it's not going to be this year because we had enough bad things happening this year but uh, my meaning is that i'm not saying that to say because uh, i've got the feeling that i'm saying everything is good but it's the case girl. they're good but they're different so that's uh, what can you talk a little bit yeah. about uh, uh, Vernet and uh, Vernet, right. about Vernet, the town, and the uh, like, the Clos de la Cavedu? Right. Right, right, right. So Vernet, Vernet, alors, Vernet as you know, it's uh, it's always been a, it's a, in a way it's like my playground. You know, uh, I've learned I've learned to make wine in Pomar, and I was making some Vernet. So it's an area I know a lot. Uh, when I've started my own label in 2007, uh, of course, it's uh, where I uh, where I've started to to look for for some wine. So um, inside Volnay, I have a, a various premier cru. 
and, and of course one village uh, which is right beneath Mitan. Alors Mitan, Volney Mitan is always like the, the most approachable when it's young. It's a uh, foot of the slope, pretty wrong, uh, quite nice. We have a new label which will come in 1718. It's uh, Volney Centeno. So here we are on the, um, we are on the commune of Meursault, but it's making a pretty, you know, strong tannic and, uh, and muscular style of, uh, of Volney. Pretty old vine, super low crop. Uh, we have Cairé. Cairé, there's no, uh, there's no, there's no uh, big need of explaining what is Cairé. If, if the Côte de Beaune had another Grand Cru, it would be Volney Cairé, without any doubt. And, uh, and the fourth one uh, is Claude La Cave des Ducs. So Claude La Cave des Ducs is, uh, you know, is the monopole uh, we have. It's a, it's a wine we're making since the beginning. Uh, just to, to remind you, I established my label in 2007, but uh, I had the idea to, you know, to, 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 to make it before. And actually I bought the, the fruits of Claude La Cave des Ducs in 2006 before. So that was the first one I've made, uh, actually, uh, alors not under my name, because at that time I made the wine, but I sold it after to Contarman. But uh, I'm making the Claude Lacave since 2006. And uh, if you happen to find a Volney village from Contarman 2006, it's Claude Lacave des Ducs, actually. Uh, but that said, uh, it's, it's a beautiful place. Alors, when we took over, it was pretty well made. Uh, it was not organic, but uh, but not far from being. And uh, now it's uh, voilà, fully organic, biodynamic. Uh, it's a 0 0.6 hectares uh, vineyard. So it's, um, sometimes it's hard to find on the map. The new map is showing, it's showing the name, but sometimes it's most of the time it's writing Le Village. Uh, the, the particular thing with Claude Lacave des Ducs, it's really in the village and it's uh, surrounded by houses, which probably, you know, uh, uh, eight years ago was not, uh, known as the best because uh, you had more shade from the house and uh, more protection from the wind and and uh, you know when it was colder and with uh, with higher crop uh, more difficult today with uh, with the type of weather we've got and the viticulture we're doing it's it, it's a top 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 appellation the particular things with Claude Lacar I think it's uh, that it's uh, producing pretty floral uh, aromatics. And it's a pretty, well, to me, I know it very well, but it's a pretty easy wine to pick on the blind tasting. And this floral aspect is pretty unique to, uh, first to Volney and inside Volney, beside Chateau des Ducs and Claude Lacave des Ducs. And so Chateau des Ducs from Lafarge, there's, there's no other places where you could find that type of, uh, of aromatics. So it's a nice, uh, it's, an, it's, uh, it's a monopole. Huh? We are the only one to make it. So uh, I, can, uh, I, can, I can, with no doubt, saying we're making the best Claude Lacave des Ducs. Where does your straight Volnay come from? The straight, the straight Volnay, so I was talking of Mitan. So if you, if some of you's got a map and if, you, if you're going down the slopes or down the village, you have beneath, just beneath, uh, beneath Volney, there's a little uh, hamlet called La Chapelle. And uh, just on the side of La Chapelle, I've got Premier Cru Mitan. And just beneath, uh, there's, there's a vine called Grand Champ. And Grand Champ is the big field. It's uh, a little part is, is, is classified as Premier Cru. And we're just beneath. So the half Volney village is actually half Premier Cru and half village but it's on the border of, uh, so there's, there's two ways of seeing it, you know. I could have sold the part in Premier Cru, but I will have said I'm right next to the village. But it, for me, it was making more sense to put everything in village. So we do it straight in fruit. You know, we're picking the parcel all together. It's going in the same tank and, uh, and, uh, and voila. So it's a village on the border of Premier Cru. But the cube is always like half half, 50% Premier Cru, 50% village. And the, the premier cru is called Gigot. Okay, you probably can see it. Uh, so I've got Gigot, Carrel, and, uh, and uh, Grand Champ. It's a small cuvee. Huh? Usually we don't, it's free parcel, but we don't make more than five barrels. So 1,500, uh, 1500 uh, bottles. 
just to give a, mm. an idea. I, I think also one of the things to know, because we're talking of, uh, of Volney and I was naming uh, Santeneau, because we have some uh, we have some evolution also here. You know, uh, I've started as a and I'm still uh, a negotiant. I'm very proud of uh, being a negos, but as you know, uh, no no family uh, no family holding any vineyards. So I'm starting only purchasing fruit. But since uh, 2017, uh, so the holding of vineyards uh, grew up quite uh, substantially. Uh, we used to have 3.5 hectares before, now we have 7.6 hectares. So uh, in 2000, which the first production was 2000, uh, 2018. So now most of the vineyards are in Meursault with, uh, with more Bourgogne Blanc, more Meursault village. Uh, we have in addition uh, some, uh, some Meursault Charme, some Meursault Premier Cru Blani, and Blani Premier Cru Red on top of Volnay saint -Nôme. So you will see also more and more of those appellations uh, in the future. Because mm -hmm. of course, uh, of course I'm, uh, I'm gonna focus more also on the vine we're holding, you know, than uh, the idea never been to grow up, you know, uh, bigger. It's, to, it's always to make better. So uh, when when we have the opportunity, we know we 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 slowing down on some of the fruit purchase and uh, and 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 keep the focus on 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 our vine. But the the image of Meursault and and then for Volney will will definitely uh, stick more and more to high image. How many Ben? Uh, can huh? you can you say something about your, your Blanet uh, Rouge Premier Cru, uh, about that particular cuvee? Wait, wait, uh, which one? Which Blanet Premier Cru? You're talking of? Uh, Blanet Rouge. The, ah, the, the Blanet uh, Rouge, sorry. Blanet yeah, Rouge, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, alors, the Blanet, uh, the, alors, Blanet, Blanet the, the things to know with Blanet. Blanet is, uh, so if you look again on the map, uh, Blani is, uh, is above Meursault. It belongs to Meursault, but uh, the appellation uh, is uh, split between Puligny and Meursault. So all our vineyards are on the Meursault side. Uh, alors, when, it's, when it's red, it could be either Puligny or Meursault side, it's called Blani. And when it's white, it has to be called Meursault or Puligny. Uh, so over there, we have 2.2 hectares. Uh, it's uh, the geology on the slope is, uh, is really split in, in two. The foot of the slope has got more iron oxide, much less topsoil, and uh, definitely a good place for Pinot. And uh, the top of the slope is uh, more white marl with, uh, with some very sharp stone called uh, Don Chien, the dog's teeth, and uh, definitely for, for Chardonnay. Historically, the appellation was like largely largely planted with uh, with Pinot, but uh, through time, as many many owners are are from Merceau or Puligny, most of the Pinot has been pulled out and uh, replaced by Chardonnay. Uh, but you could also understand that for for white grower, it could be uh, you know it could be uh, a pain to have only one 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 cuvee of red. On top of that, historically, you know, like when you're picking, you, you're picking everything in one row. So if you pick your Chardonnay at the right time and you go straight after to your Pinot, it, there's a high chance it could be a bit green because not, not ripe enough. But by tradition, you know, the, when you have the team, you pick. That's, that was the old way. So Blani had this reputation of making, uh, making, uh, making uh, let's say, uh, rustic and, 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 and green reds. But if you work if you work them well, and especially with, with warmer weather now, uh, which is make make the job much easier, uh, we are we holding old vines. We don't exceed 35 hectoliters, and uh, it's making beautiful reds, beautiful reds with lots of elegance. It's uh, so, some people say the style is 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 closer from Volney than any other villages. Um, I would say that the style is definitely Blani. So what? When, when I'm saying, when I was also saying that, you know, um, 
lots of reds, you know, like it's been replaced by Chardonnay. Today, you have only 5.3 hectares of Pinot Noir left in Blani. So the appellation is, is quite small, but that said, there's a there's couple of growers who are now starting to replant some some Pinot over there. So it's 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 it, it's a great it, it's a good it's a good sign. But me, I'm making I'm making the Blani. You know, I bought my first vine in 2013, so I'm making Blani since 14. And what I can say from my my short experience of making every year, it's making a great wine. And that's definitely the sign of a you know of a of a strong strong terroir. And uh, the, um, the 2018 is you know when when I was saying the reputation is to make it was was like slightly you know uh, uh, greeny style of uh, of Pinot. Uh, the 2018 is is dark, is uh, is uh, deep and uh, lots of spice and uh, love it, love it. And, and if you look, if you look at, uh, you know, that the, the, the price for the, for the quality, it's, 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 it's a great wine, you know, so I will, I will fight for this appellation. You know, it's what we've done on, uh, for the harvest team, we, we've done, uh, we've done in Blani with Trust. It's all a t-shirt now. So uh, if you want, I'll send you a couple of t-shirts for, for you. <laughs> yeah. That wine is fantastic, so. Benjamin, I have a question. Right. Yeah, I have a question for you. This is Jesse here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Bourgogne Cote d'Or Pinot Noir, that appellation, and then also that special bottling? We have uh, ah, some of that 17. Bottling. Yeah, we have some of right. that 17 in our inventory. Right. Alors, in, Mag in Magnum, yeah. Bourgogne Cote d'Or is, a, is a, you know, it's like it's a fairly new appellation in, in, uh, in, in Burgundy. I should say at the beginning, uh, I think, First vintage is 2016. Correct me uh, if I'm wrong, Peter. I think we only we only allowed to use uh, to use Bourgogne Pinot Noir since 16 or 15, maybe. Right. The idea the idea there was to to prove to the consumer that actually the wines coming from Cote d'Or right, and not from elsewhere, because you know that uh, you know you can use Beaujolais in Bourgogne, you can uh, you can use Macon to make Bourgogne Blanc, you can use Chablis to make Bourgogne Blanc. So that that's the first uh, the first point, and uh, to me, I never I, I was not not convinced by the idea, but uh, now I am first. So uh, in 2019, all my Bourgogne Rouge have uh, because you, you need you need to to register your vine as Bourgogne Cote d'Or before. So uh, maybe we will do that in the future. You know, label our Bourgogne as Bourgogne Cote d'Or, but. To come back to the 17 and the magnum bottling, it's uh, so you you know that on the label there's a, a little uh, there's two letter PM. It's a cuvee of uh, actually it's a mix of uh, 50 50 50 percent of uh, Pomar village and uh, Moret Saint Denis. So it's half Côte de Beaune and half Côte de Nuit. Alors, what's the idea behind this? Uh, believe me, there were no idea there. Uh, basically, it's uh, it's a pure uh, it's a pure um, accident in a way. Uh, I was like uh, like before each bottling, you know, I'm tasting every single barrels. Uh, I'm checking that they're all going together uh, well, and uh, and I was doing my Pomar and my Maurice and me uh, tasting that day, and a few other villages. So it was villages from Côte de Bonne and Côte de Nuit. And for Poma and, and Maurice and me, uh, well, there were one barrel way which, uh, well, I mean, it was good, but it was not it was not doing well with the others. So uh, I decided to put it apart, and maybe, you know, I, I had no idea. But uh, anyway, my final bottling will be only with three barrels, and uh, something happened with the other appellation. Uh, so I had like a, a barrel left of Poma, a barrel left of Maurice and me. And uh, it was a long tasting this afternoon, that afternoon. And to make it short, you know, I was starting to uh, have the feeling that I was needing a glass of wine to uh, enjoy my, uh, my afternoon of tasting. And uh, the only things I had in front in which was left was the glass of uh, uh, the bottle of uh, the, you know, the sample of Pomar and Maurice and me. So basically what I've done, uh, just to play, you know, I put, I put them together just to have a glass. 
and uh, I was talking with someone else. Then I, well, I took the wine, put it to my nose. I said, oh, that's actually interesting. Tasted the wine and actually it was great, you know, but it, I had no idea of doing that blend. So instead, you know, we made the wine, we vinified those wines. So instead of like, because if, if there's a barrel I don't like, you know, I might put it back on the market. He will go to the big house, big, big negotiation house and then that's it, you know. And the wine was, was just, you know, I, I really loved it. So uh, I finished the glass. The following day, you know, I tried, I tried again the, the blend. It was good. A week later, the blend was still great. So um, I called, I think I called, I called you, Peter. I called uh, one another client and I said, you know what, do you think if I'm, you know, making a Bourgogne Côte d'Or, it's a, it's a great wine, but um, it's, it's maybe, it's maybe we, we, it's not, we can't reproduce it. It's done one, one year. And uh, that's what we've done. So it's called PM. It's Pomar and Moresani. It might happen again in the future. I think it's a great thing if it works, you know. And uh, we can't use some of the village or even Premier Cru. We might do another Bourgogne Côte d'Or like that in Magnum. And then the letter at the bottom of the label will change. So it might be, I don't know, it could be, uh, you know, be, uh, we have to be careful of the, of, uh, but, but to be sure there's no meaning, but... Uh, it could be voilà, Volney and uh, Gevray Chambertin, or... but uh, who knows? So it was a one-off. It was a one-off, but I love the wine. Good, thank you. I have another question for you uh, real quick. You say that you cut your teeth in Volney in the southern part of the Côte d'Or, uh, but you also make wine from uh, Gevray, right? And Maurice saint -Denis. Yeah. What do you do different um, or do you do anything different? Uh, in the fruit from the north than you do from the fruit from the south? Well, I do nothing different. Okay. <laughs> no, it's, uh, uh, believe, you know, that's, that's, that's why we call, that's why we call terroir. I don't, I, I never have an image of the wine when I'm making wine. It's uh, basically, uh, philosophy is the same. Alors, of course, you adapt yourself because you can't extract the same tannin in Gevray Chambertin that you can in Nuit Saint-Georges, but that's, that's purely done by taste. But it's not, there's, there's no recipe if you want. And, uh, but every year, of course, when I'm making a Savigny Le Bon or a Volney Village, I know that in Savigny, I will probably do less plunging than in Gevray Chambertin. But everything is done by taste. Alors, there's, no, there's no real difference. But after, to give you an answer, it's much easier to make Côte de Nuit than Côte de Bon. So uh, me, for me, who grew up in Côte de Beaune, it was a piece of cake to, uh, to arrive in Côte de Nuit and make wine. I think to do it the other way, it's, it's, more, it's more difficult. Because when you can, when you can, when you can master, you know, like the Pinot of Côte de Beaune, uh, uh, it should, I mean, you, the, the quality of the Pinot in Côte de Nuit, I, I mean, with no doubt, it's, it's much easier much easier and uh, the more you gain higher when it's the Grand Cru it's uh, you know you don't need you don't need to have a, to be a rocket scientist to make great wine then it makes by itself right really no I mean, it's true it's really I mean it's it's uh, the quality is already in the grape it's all there it's all there but when you're making like a blend your blend your rouge you have to you know, your window of picking is like super short. You have to, you have to, you can't, you know, you, you, it should be the same everywhere. Huh? I'm not saying I'm not taking any, any I'm not uh, uh, taking care of the Côte de Nuit. My meaning is like, if you do a slight mistake in Côte de Nuit, you won't see it in the end because it, it works. In the Côte de Beaune, you have to, to be super precise all the time. So when, when you've learned with this precision, it's, it's, it's super easy to, to get to the Côte de Nuit. So, uh, voilà, for me, for me it's, uh, it's really relaxing to make Côte de Nuit. <laughs> Thank you. If you are. But there are some differences, of course. Of course. What, and what, give us an example of what, uh, what would be different during the vinification with Côte de Bonne versus Côte de Nuit. No, I think, I think it's the, 
the, di the difference with, with Pinot Noir, you always like uh, it's like uh, walking on a on a string, you know, like uh, without any uh, safety net. Uh, <laughs> Pinot Pinot can be average. It's either good or bad. It's, uh, it's how it works in winemaking. So it, no, it's it, the, the hardest. The, I think the key the key thing and the hardest thing is the is the picking date. Picking date and of course all the viticulture before. But uh, if you've done everything, you know, well in the vineyards and, uh, and the weather treats you well, uh, there's still so many mistakes done at the uh, at picking time. Mm. And the great thing today with with uh, with the logistic, with you know, with what we've got, it's, it could seem you know strange for you. Like I mean, now we're doing a Zoom uh, conference. Uh, is uh, is, is now, now you can we're checking every single vine, you know, quite vine vineyards, and everything is checked, and we can we we can we can you know pick for two days, stop and and restart uh, three days later, and when something we were not doing before. So the 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 key the key is there, and when you pick at the right, which is not easy, and the ripe year like with the sunny year, actually the window is getting shorter and shorter and shorter, even if we have no disease. And almost no sorting we have to pick super fast so you have to you know i used to pick at the beginning with a team of uh, 30 people max now we have we have we have days where we can have 200 pickers whoa so we have to be we have to have the winery equipped for that but in the end we might pick only for nine days ten days so it doesn't it makes it makes the the the, the picking the picking time shorter but we need to be equipped like a, you know, like like a, a bigger a bigger uh, facility. But we're only treating smaller volume. So all this logistic part change a lot. Alors the, the difference, the variation is after between a Gevre and a Maurice Saint Denis. Believe me, it's not it's not different because the the all the difference you will find in the wine and the the, the texture, the aromatics is already in the fruit. It's already there. Me, me, I'm not, I'm not doing anything, you know, I don't have in mind, you know, Moray should be more aromatic and less tannic and Gevre, I mean, if the, and Gevre should be, you know, strong and tannic. If you have a vintage with, which is pretty light in terms of tannin, yeah, my wine will be, will be light. No problem, you know, it's better to have a, a nice and smooth uh, tannin than, than a, and a big, uh, big green and rustic tannin. The point, the point when you do, when you make wine, I think the most important is that you have to do nothing after in the aging because you can't you you, you can you can never correct well a wine uh, during aging each time you do something so i'm talking of a you know if you have to do a stronger fining or if you have to do uh, the less you do uh, you, the less you do to a wine the better it is for the for the final product and uh, and that's the key the key is there so uh, in the winemaking, my job is to is to to achieve the the, the wine which will be the closest from the, the the wine you will find in the bottle. That I'm never thinking of. Uh, that's why I never thought about blending Pomar and Maurice Saint Denis. It never it never crossed my mind, and I never tried again actually. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, strange, but sometimes it works. Hey, ben. Ben, right? Yeah. Pardon. Uh, one of my favorite wines of yours to drink every year is the Auxi de Rest Blanc. Uh, it's in certain vintages, I think it's on par qualitatively with some of the Premier Cruz. Can you talk about that vineyard and what makes that wine so special? Oui, alors Auxi du Rest, Auxi du Rest, it's, uh, it's actually the, fir the, first, the first fruits I bought uh, because I've started actually the um, the micro negos activity, I started it on the Contarment and I started it in 2001 because I used to make Rosé du Rest Blanc at Contarment and uh, at the time we were renting the vineyards and uh, the owner of those vineyards was wanting to take them over for, for their children and uh, they did. So in 2000, uh, I had no Rosé du Rest to make and uh, I missed them. I really missed them. Be they were beautiful, you know, with lots of energy. I always loved this appellation. So in 2001, I bought a free barrel of uh, Ossé du Rest. And uh, since 2001, I'm working with the same supplier, same vineyards. The only difference is 
I'm buying all the area of the vineyards now when before I was only buying a, a part of it. So that's the type, the type of relationship we've got with growers too. You know, uh, 2001, next year, it's going to be uh, 20 years only on the one hand check. And now I'm working with the next generation, which is good. You know, it's great to see it. Uh, but Ossé du Reste, alors uh, here we're working with uh, three different Lyodi. We are on the south part, so which means on the edge of, uh, of Meursault. We have a uh, boutonnier. So if you, if you look again at the map and you, you look at the edge of, uh, of Meursault, uh, from bottom to top, you have boutonnier, you have macabre, and uh, ôté. And uh, here it's a pretty, I mean, uh, Ossé du Reste, huh? uh, lots of limestone, very, very, uh, very shallow topsoil, uh, 10, 15 centimeter, 20 centimeter max. Uh, you can't, uh, pretty, uh, pretty hard to, uh, you know, to plant a post or when you plant a new one, you need to break the rock. So very mineral. Um, it's also... This area, so it's on the edge of Merceau, but I will never produce a Merceau. So, for example, I'm making also Merceau Vireuil, which in that side is on the edge of Ossé du Reste, but the exposure is different. So, here in Ossé du Reste, we, we, it's facing east, southeast, so it's seeing, it's seeing a lot of the, 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 the morning sun, but uh, missing a part of the evening sun, which is a warmer, warmer, warmer sun. So, it's always keeping a lot of freshness and very zesty. Uh, so again, you know, warm vintages, but the Ossé du Reste is still straight and vibrant. And, uh, and I love those appellations because Burgundy is not only about, uh, I'm happy to have some Merceau huh, and uh, to have bought some vineyard in Merceau. But believe me, if there's, a, if there's an opportunity in Ossé du Reste, I'll go there. But same thing, it's, it's a, there's a future there. And, uh, and again, it's, the, the price, the price are still pretty, uh, pretty fair, and uh, and it's I love being there. Same thing as Saint Romain on top, you know, with making Sous le Chateau, making a bit of Montli Blanc, Les Dures, and uh, the beautiful wine, very good. And it's it's a wine you could you could, what I like with Ossé, you could you could you could you could you could open Young, you could uh, I open a ninety six. Uh, the other day. Still beautiful. Beautiful wine. You know, like all the 90s are like more on the on the on the sweet corn, uh, a bit of black of uh, white truffle. Uh, uh, you, you can send nice. one of those. I, I think I still got one. Now you have to come, you have to come over. We'll share it. I will see you <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah, I'll come to you. Peter, thank you. Thank you, man. No, uh, anybody else? Right. Any thank you. Thank you very much, man. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. And fantastic presentation. Thank you for your time. All right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's short. I can I can speak two hours if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. We need drinks. <laughs> I'll go get a bottle. <laughs> Merci. Oh, Merci. Well, Peter, uh, my, my beard looks like yours. <laughs> Who's cutting your hair? Oh. I need help. Hey, ciao.